Had I not gotten furloughed from that job, chances are we don't do a season two. Hollowell, host of the Pure Flix podcast and the Pure Flix Insider, and I'm excited to be here today for our Vindication After Show. This is going to be a great conversation. We are joined today by Jared O'Flaherty. He is the writer and the director of the show, and Todd Terry, who plays Sergeant Gary Travis. They're going to be joining us to talk all about season two, which is streaming on Pure Flix, and we're going to get into all of that when you can watch it, and when the episodes are dropping. But episodes one and two have dropped on Pure Flix. Jared and Todd, how are you guys doing today? Hey, Billy. It's good to hey, be here. Hey, Billy. Yeah, absolutely. Excited for season two to begin since it has. Yes, well, it is. <laughs> it is exciting. It is exciting. And, you know, episodes one and two are live. And so here's a little disclaimer. If you're watching this right now and you have not watched episodes one and two, of season two. You might want to sort of not listen right now, come back to this. If you have, this is going to be a conversation that you want to check out. Now, Jared, let's let's start with the response that we've seen to Vindication. What is it like to sort of see this Vindination excitement building around the series? Well, as you can imagine, it's great. You know, you you pour your your heart and your time and and everything you've got into a show, but you never really know what are people going to think about this. How are they going to feel? And are they going to connect? And are the, is everything going to come across the way you wanted it to? So it's just been phenomenal to see audiences and and fans. You know, can we use that term, fans? You know, people who who are invested in the show and and love it and are excited to to see what happens next. So so it's really a nice uh, affirmation. Uh, uh, for all the effort that we put in, that that people are uh, appreciative and enjoy the show. Yeah, no, that that's that's incredible. And you're you're the mind behind it, the writer, the director. You know, for you, Todd, you kind of have this other perspective as the person who is bringing the character, the main character, to life. What has it been like for you to watch the trajectory of Vindication and the excitement build around it? It's been great. It's it's been it far surpasses anything I ever imagined. You know, our Jared and I's relationship actually began at a Christian media artist. Uh, I guess it was just a, an event. And I met Jared and, you know, he said, hey, do you want to do a short film? And from there, it turned into a second season of Vindication, which is amazing. But, you know, my hat goes off to Jared. He is he wears very many hats and uh, has done a fantastic job. So you thought when you first got involved, just so in case people don't realize this, you just said it, but I want to reiterate it because it's important. You thought this was a short film, sort of one off situation. You never realized or thought in a million years that you'd be sitting here talking about a season two after 20 episodes. Yeah, it wasn't until we were at a festival. I think uh, uh, it had won some awards and we were at a festival in Austin and uh, Jared, you know, after the show was over, came up and said, hey, I'm thinking about potentially turning it into a TV series. I don't know how far along he was at that time, but I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm on board. And so, uh, yeah, and here we are. So, I again, I never would have imagined we would have gotten this far, and uh, the feedback's been great. So, super excited. All right, so here we are. Now, we have episodes one and two of season two. They have dropped. So the fans have had a chance to see these episodes. And I want to sort of dive in to the content because there's so many interesting things going on in those episodes. Jared, episode one, okay, that cliffhanger at the end, what made you guys decide to end the episode there? Because it really leaves you, like you watch it, and you're like, okay, I need to know now who this person is and, wh and what's going to happen from here. What made you choose that? We you know something we found in season one from audience feedback is as the season got rolling around episodes five, six, seven of season one, we started doing some cliffhangers, some ongoing storylines and audiences love that. You know, you, you get messages from people saying, I sat down just to watch a couple episodes tonight and now it's three in the morning and I because I couldn't stop because you kept giving those cliffhangers. And we thought, well, you know what, that, that's something in season two then we can be intentional about. You know, n not so much that you are bait and switch or anything 
anything like that, but just give people a reason that they want to keep watching instead of uh, wrapping everything up in a single episode. Uh, so when uh, you know this character that was introduced at the end of episode one, when the idea came about, it, it just was a natural moment that we could use as something to uh, entice audiences to keep going. Yeah, and for you, um, Todd, knowing that your character, you know, Sergeant Travis, was going to have this connection to this character, what was it like for you kind of going into that, reading the script, seeing that, and sort of knowing that you'd be the one that had to bring that to life? What was that process like for you? I think I had a bit of a heads up, if I remember. Jared may have mentioned, uh, you know, that character, Doris. Uh, but reading it on paper, it really did. It brought it to life. And, you know, as an actor, it's what, you know, that's the kind of stuff you dream about is is building up your backstory. Um, and just because it informs everything else. It informs Travis's character in season one and his relationship with Katie. Uh, you know, and, and as this second season goes along, you'll find out a lot of those things and, you know, maybe think, hey, this is why he acts the way he does, that kind of thing, based on his relationship with with Doris. I'm not going to give too much because um, <laughs> there's more episodes to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot there. It makes you want to know more again. But that's the key, though, right? You got you guys are building something. I love what you were saying before, Jared, too, about the connection right between the stories, even. So you have the, the connection between the stories that extends episode to episode. And then in this case, we're talking about relationships that help us learn who the characters are. And in your case, I have to ask you, Todd, because I'm intrigued to know the answer to this. I don't I don't think I've asked you this before, but when it comes to Travis and who he is as a person, right, and the character that you're helping bring alive, and it comes to you as a person, what are some of the similarities and differences in real life Todd versus Sergeant Travis? <laughs> oh, is this a confessional now? Okay, I got it. Uh, <laughs> you, you know what? I think there's there's universal pain in people in general. That I think as an actor, you know, you can bring to a character, you know, there's a, there's the trappings of the character, the job and those kind of things that most actors don't have that experience of having that job. I was never a police officer, obviously, but, you know, you do some of that research to study, you know, the mechanics of things. But it's a universal uh, thing with emotion between people and characters. And those relationships bring out similar pain, although the circumstances may not be the same, they can still communicate. So, you know, I've had things in my life, uh, losses and, and things, you know, familial, you know, growing up that I can relate to, uh, you know, kind of the pain Travis has, um, you know, based on those relationships in the show. And I would imagine that as an actor, that helps you sort of bring that alive, right? You take that experience, you bring it in, and then, you know, you help sort of create that within within the character, which you do a great yeah. job of. Now, now I have to ask you, Jared, just getting back to to episode one in season two. Now, you choose to introduce this particular character, Doris, and she's in, obviously, the first two episodes. I don't know if you can take us behind the curtain at all, because I think people would be interested to know – as you were writing and then obviously directing, but writing this and putting it together, were there other characters, and I don't know how much you'd want to tell us, or other narratives that you had considered possibly diving into that you chose not to? You know, Were there other avenues that you were considering? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and, and there, there's a lot of information behind that. When you look at season one, we really explored the relationship between uh, Travis and Katie. That that was a recurring theme, episode to episode to episode. And it had a nice arc from when we first found them to where they, they ended up in, in the finale of season one. And so moving along to a new season, I thought, you know, we don't want to revisit that. Let's, let's not redo the same thing in a new season. There, there needs to be a new element there. Um, in filming season one, when we got towards the end of it, we, we didn't know if there was going to be a season two or not. And I remember on set one day talking with Peggy Schott, who plays Becky Travis, and asking her, hey, what would you like, what, what do you think uh, Becky would be up to if, if we got to do another season? You know, just off the top of your head. And she's, she came back and said, you know, I think it would be neat if she was involved in prison ministry, you know, something that's uh, rehabilitative instead of punitive. You know, Travis is throwing people in jail and then she's going to work with them. She's like, I would love to see that. Now at the time, we didn't know if there was going to be a se season two or not. So it was, okay, thank you. 
So when it came time to develop a story and start writing, hey, that, that was a starting point. Okay, in season two, Becky has moved along. She's not a uh, weekend accountant, you know, as we established in season one. She's now uh, doing prison ministry. And we thought, well, well, what could happen? What, what are some unique situations? And the first that came to mind was the, uh, uh, the man at the end of season one, uh, the one who was involved in uh, what happened to her daughter and the pregnancy and those sort of things. What would happen if she ran into him while she's doing prison ministry? And it just look at all these emotions that would happen. You know, how would she feel towards this person and so forth? Uh, unfortunately, the actor wasn't going to be available, though. So we, we had this idea we really liked, but then it was, well, then who who can she run into? What can happen? And that's when the idea of Doris came about. And and we love it. We, we love that what it, it means for the season and also how it relates to Travis. Yeah, and that's a really interesting juxtaposition, what you just mentioned, the fact that you know, he's putting people in jail. She's then going in you know, through prison you know, ministry and trying to, trying to kind of bring those people into the faith to talk to them, to help them through their issues. That's, that's a really interesting you know, dichotomy between the two of them. And that kind of brings me to into, you know, Todd, looking at your character, looking at Travis, and it seems like – his faith has grown from season one to season two. It seems like you're getting some, some, you know, I think lenses into some of the change he's going through. But you see both Becky and Travis kind of doing this, this interesting thing of showing good works, right? Living out their faith. And you see that in the first two episodes of season two. And when I think about that, I think, okay, you've got this cop, right? And he is, he's got to be tough sometimes. He's got to go after cases. He's got to hold his staff accountable. He's got to put people in jail. And then you've got him, you know, giving, giving some money away to help, you know, a single mother. You've got him doing these kind things. What was it like for you to sort of carry the character from season one into that sort of growth in faith and that balance that I just described in season two? You know, it's interesting. I <clears throat> I was thinking about that. You know, the first season, you know, is in a sense at the end, at least, is some, you know, as far as Travis's character is coming to Christ. Uh, whereas season two is a bit of sanctification for him. You know, he's growing in his faith, whereas Becky, you know, has been the rock and she, you know, has been more consistent, obviously, you know, that she's been a believer longer. So, He's taken baby steps, you know, and we hear, you know, he's going to be part of a men's group, things like that. Uh, it's been great. It's funny. I, watching it, I was like, I'm, I, <laughs> I was looking, I go, where's that tougher side of Travis? And I didn't intentionally try to do anything different specifically, but I, I see it, you know, in the first couple of episodes that the, there's a little more softness than there was in season in season one. But long story short, for me, Travis was all about, you know, the moniker, the police moniker, protect and serve. Well, season one is about protection. Season two, he's beginning to serve. So he's kind of mirroring those two worlds, you know. Mm. You know, Todd, I, I saw recently on some online forums where people were talking about the show as they were starting to watch season one. And they said, I really hope this detective becomes more likable because he's kind of tough right now. So so maybe in season two, we did go a little bit more that direction. I love that. Well, and for you, Jared, was that a big So as you were preparing? Cause, and we're going to talk in a little bit behind the scenes of your life between the two the two seasons. But as you were moving into season two and writing that, how much thought was going into that about just how you were going to craft and, and sort of assemble who Travis was and whether or not there'd be a difference between the seasons in terms of that tone? Yeah, well, I don't think it's a spoiler that uh, by the end of season one, uh, Travis is a believer. You know, that's kind of where we leave off. So immediately in going into a season two, we had to think, well, what's going to be different about him? He, he's not, he can't be the same guy because when someone gives their life to Christ, obviously that's, that starts changing from day one. Now, it, it's not that overnight he suddenly becomes a theologian and a pastor where he has the answer to everything. Uh, he's still going to have struggles. So we wanted that to be very real, that, that this guy who's, you know, in his, uh, I think, 50s, we say, uh, that when he comes to follow Christ, he's got 50 years of habits and tendencies and everything else that aren't going to change overnight. So that gave us kind of a framework of how to create a character and show him uh, where he's still going to have his flaws, but his foundation is now in the right spot. And, and he can go back to that uh, in times of, of turmoil. 
Yeah, and it's and it's particularly pertinent to our lives and to real life because what you did was he becomes a Christian, and then you, as the writer and the director, you're like, you know what, we're going to throw a whole bunch of stuff his way. Not that he didn't have challenges in season one, he most definitely did, but in season two, now he's a believer and he's got all of these things that he doesn't even know about some of the challenges that are going to be coming toward him, and he has to navigate that, which is so real for all of us who are going through things in life, and when we're Christians, trying to kind of navigate that and figure it out. And so I, I love that because it, it's not this message of, oh, everything's going to be great now, uh, which obviously, if that were the case, you wouldn't have as compelling of a, of a show. And here you're showing him kind of going through those things. And one of the themes related to that is second chances. And I don't want you to give anything away. And I know you're not going to, even if I begged you to, but <laughs> this theme of second chances what is it generally – first, why did you choose it as a main theme? Because it is something that we see obviously happening at least in the first couple of episodes here in season two. Um, why? And it, and it was a theme in season one. Why did you choose it and what are you really hoping to do with that theme for the viewer? Yeah, well, the idea of second chances or even third or fourth or fifth chances is very – scriptural. It's what the gospel is about. You know, it's what, what Jesus told people. It's what he preached to them. Uh, we live in a world now, this this whole cancel culture thing, that if you mess up one time, uh, you're done, right? You're, you're canceled. You you're, you don't have a voice anymore. Your story's over because you made a mistake. And, and that's this predominant theme, you know, where people are trying to catch others. Of course, as long as it's not me, but if it's somebody <laughs> else, okay, they're canceled, right? And I thought, well, let's let's remind people that that's that's not what the gospel is. That's not what Jesus taught. You know, second chances are very much for all of us who are believers. That's what it's about. You know, a new life, uh, uh, a chance to start again uh, in him. So anyway, uh, what a what a theme to build the season on and and to start the stories. So uh, that was really where it started. And there's so much that can grow from that. There's so many ways you can go with that. And, and you can challenge people, you know, or you're willing to accept a second chance yourself. Are you willing to give it to others? And you'll see that play out uh, as the season goes along. Well, and that's what's so powerful about this show. And I think that's why there's a whole vindication. There's a following. There's people who love it because it, again, shows us all of those things in real time. You're watching stories that are complicated, things that are happening, forgiveness and second chances. These are things we all deal with in real life. And everything you just said is so true about the power and the importance of second chances. And that's what, you know, gospel culture is. It, it's offering second chances when people have made mistakes, if they want that forgiveness, that that forgiveness is there for them. And so you see this playing out within the show. And that's profound because it's entertainment and it's good entertainment, but it leaves you with something so much more. Now, Having said that, I want to talk about second chances in a different way because you've said a couple of times that you weren't sure if there was going to be a season two, uh, and that's the case for every show on the face of the earth. You don't know what the future is going to be after you put this amazing thing together and you put it out in the world. So you did season one of the show just to kind of give a little behind the scenes, and then after season one, you kind of went back out into the corporate world again. But but you ended up, obviously, thankfully, making a season two. Take us through that journey a little bit and what led you to be able to bring the show back for another season. Sure. Well, the life of an independent filmmaker is probably a little different than what you see of Hollywood filmmakers and the people doing all the interviews and the red carpet. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride of very busy, uh, things are going great, to very low moments. And my family went through that for about two years. I have four children, uh, married and and we went through that for about two years creating season one. And my, my daughters, they were hitting teenage years. They need, th you know, uh, cars and, and braces. And, and they just get more expensive, right, as teenagers. And, and they were also growing. And our house was starting to get rather full because what used to be little kids are now, you know, young adults. So I kind of made the commitment to them, hey, once season one comes out, uh, we'll step away from the roller coaster, get on something a little bit more stable, and, and I'll go take a corporate job, you know, so we can upgrade our house and, and do some other things, you know. So I did that for five or six months, and of course the filmmaking itch came out. This Vindy Nation, uh, as we're calling it, started to grow, and people are saying, what happens next? Is there a season two? And, you know, here I am in a cubicle answering, you know, phones and doing other things, and the itch came back. So uh, our, our uh, executive producers, distribution partners came back and said, hey, let's at least get going on two, two new episodes. We don't know about a season, but let's do two. So that episode one and two that you just watched
watch was what was written in that time and what came out of it. We didn't know particularly if it, how far it was going to go, and we scheduled to shoot, shoot it in April of 2020. So anyone that knows their, uh, their history over the last 18 months <laughs> knows April of 2020, there wasn't a whole lot going on, especially when you have to fly in actors. And, and so everything was shut down, and we uh, basically had to uh, abort that plan. Well, the company I was working at at the time, uh, uh, they did the furloughs, you know, where some people were indefinitely put on hold. It wasn't laid off. It was just don't come to work and we can't pay you right now because nobody knew what was going to happen. You know, and none of us knew where things going to go up, get back to normal or what. So during that time that I'm kind of like, OK, uh, what's going on now is when the opportunity came about to do an entire season two. And, and it came about. So um, had I not gotten furloughed from that job, chances are we don't do a season two, you know, because I, again, had made a commitment to my family that we were not going to get back on the roller coaster. Oh, look where we are now. But sure. anyway, so <laughs> you're back. You're definitely back. Uh, sometimes on the roller coaster. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, God has other plans. Right. You know, so and I'm thankful because, you know, we got nearly. Two two 250 people that ended up working on season two at different times. Wow. Uh, we, we've already got international. I mean, it's going to go all over the place. Uh, you know, it's on Pure Flix and for their audience. So anyway, I, I'm glad it happened. But as far as second chances, it was one of those things that was not certain uh, from the time we wrapped season one. Yeah, and, and it sounds like there were a lot of really interesting God moments in there. Um, obviously, you just described you wouldn't have been able to do it had that furlough not happened. And it's it's interesting because I think a lot of times we have these struggles happen or these moments happen or we think, OK, well, I'm done with that. I guess I'm not going to be doing that. And God's like, no, 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 I'm not done with you. And you are going to be doing that. And it's going to be, you know, a certain set of circumstances you never could have guessed. And so here we are talking about this. You were able to. And it sounds like. You know, you followed those promptings and those steps in the way you should have. And I'm so glad you did because we got a season two. So you're on that roller coaster again. And and speaking of the roller coaster, I mean, this is something it feels like you just keep going up the hill because Vindication has been um, it's aired in more than 30 countries in Europe. It's been in the Middle East. It's been dubbed in six languages. And so, Todd, for you. Because this is your face and likeness, right? Like this is the character you have brought to life along with Jared and the team. But what has it been like to sort of watch that growth? I mean, that's pretty major growth and exposure. Well, I had to learn to speak German, Russian, Spanish. To tra- I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, no, Thank it was God for fun. dubbing, was, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it was funny. I saw, I think I saw an episode in Spanish. I don't know. If, I saw one in German, but it's so surreal just to 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 see you speaking in another language. Uh, and my hats off to anybody that does that to be able to communicate the emotion, you know, in another in another language when you're not there on the set doing the doing the job. So uh, yeah, it's it it is very surreal surreal, but it's great. I haven't gotten any feedback from people overseas in general about the show, but, uh, it's great that it's out there for other people to watch. Yeah. And what do you, what do you hear, uh, you know, about the show when it, when it comes to just, you know, I'm sure obviously you've had a million conversations about the role and, you know, what you're representing and who your character is. What are some of the sentiments you hear from the fans? I think more than anything, you know, the fans seem to like it because it is not gratuitous, you know, it hits hard topics, but, you know, it doesn't go across the line, which is a lot of what we see today. So Jared and I were talking <laughs> earlier about how, you know, you feel like you could sit your teenager down and have a good conversation and they could see the show, but you're not worried about what's going to you know pop on the screen. Uh, so that's that's mm-hmm. really what I like about it. And I've heard, you know, other people that have appreciated that as well. Now, you filmed a scene that looked like it was a lot of fun to film. It's the scene in episode one where your character and a group of officers, they're chasing these kids out of the woods and the kids are getting into trouble. They're chasing them away. They're trying to scare them. It looks like it was a blast to film. Did you guys film that in the dark? Like, and maybe, Jared, you can jump in on equipment. But like, what did you need to film that? It just it looked it looked really entertaining to do. 
Yeah, we, we definitely filmed it at nighttime. Uh, it was actually the second day of shooting on season two, you know, and we were kind of coming out of lockdown, as we've called it, or quarantine for most everyone. So to even be around other people just felt a little different because it had been months since since groups of people had been gathered in any capacity. Uh, but our cinematographer, Ron Gonzalez, he can make anything look beautiful. You know, it's hey, yeah. a piece of paper on a desk and he it looks awesome. And we're all watching the monitor going, wow, that looks great. So I asked him ahead of time, I said, hey, well, you know, what do you want to do for this? Because I knew he was going to make it look great. And he had talked about, you know, renting some kind of heavy equipment to get some lights up in the air uh, down on the scene, kind of to simulate the moonlight and to give him some control over that. So uh, we spent some time and effort and, and made that happen. So we had some uh, some heavy equipment. I actually got to drive it, which was kind of neat. Uh, so we had that to light the scene. Uh, but then like the day before, I happened to reach out to the property owner and said, hey, you know, you, you know, it, it's summertime. We're in Texas. You guys, you don't, you don't have seen any snakes or anything out there on your property. And they're like, oh, well, you know, not big ones. And it's like, oh, OK, so we're going to be out in this field with high grass in the dark, you know, with a uh, bunch of teenagers running around and this other thing. So uh, we're online Googling how to scare away the snakes, you know, and came up with this potion of, of vinegar and water and something else. So we're out there with like a lawn pump, you know, the kind that pump with a little hose, spraying it over the area we're going to film uh, to make sure that we didn't have any snake sightings while we were filming that scene. But uh, it all worked out. Nobody got hurt and uh, n no snakes that I'm aware of. Yeah, you didn't mention the snakes to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wait, Todd, this is the first time you're hearing about the snakes. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, and I walked all through there during the day. I wasn't in the night scene, so, but I had a gun. I, I could have gun. shot a snake. <laughs> you could have. You could have. So, so, Todd, how do you, and I don't know how it worked for Vindication, but this is just sort of an actor question, okay, before we, we sort of move into a preview of next week's episode. But how do you keep yourself in character because I would imagine you're moving around. Sometimes you're filming scenes out of order. And I'm just curious as an actor how you do that. Because, again, you're portraying somebody else. You're creating this character. How do you keep that consistent when the circumstances around you might be changing? You're going in and out of filming and, and whatnot. You know, sometimes, you know, it's charting things out in the script, you know, you know, thematically, what is this scene about? And so you kind of know where you're, you know, where you're going with your character's arc. Uh but honestly, you know, it, it's I would say in a lot of ways, it's become easier this second season because, you know, the more you play a character, you're, you just get into their shoes and, you know, you kind of feel your way around and play with it. So Jared's done a great job of fleshing all of our characters out. So that helps a lot. It doesn't you know, he's done all the heavy lifting. We just kind of get up there and say lines, you know, I love that. That's good. Well, all right. So. We obviously have talked about the fact that episodes one and two of season two have dropped. Now, next Wednesday, we're going to see episode three. And the title of episode three is Suspicion Comes Home, which which sounds kind of suspicious. Uh, Jared, what can fans, without spoiling too much, what can fans look forward to in episode three? Yeah, so that question, Billy, is, hey, Jared, what can you spoil about the next episode for us? <laughs> without basically, spoiling it. Basically, without... how can you spoil it without spoiling it? There you go. Right. Well, we do have some new recurring cast members that are going to show up in episode three. A lot, actually. Uh, T.C. Stallings is one of them. Uh, he's going to show up in a big way in the next episode. And it's not just a, a cameo or a guest. Uh, he, he's going to become a part of the the series in the next episode. Uh, the same for Cameron Arnett. He, he shows up in that one. Uh, we've also got a character from season one that returns and appears in this episode. Um, so that's good. Uh, another storyline that I could say we're going to talk about, you know, when season one came to an end, I felt like we wrapped up a lot of things that were going on with Katie and Travis, uh, you know, with, with Becky, with uh, Chris and Travis. A lot of those were wrapped up. But there, there was this little romance between Kevin and Chris that never got any type of a resolution in season one. It was one of the things that doors that was left open. Uh, so as you've seen in the first two episodes, we're revisiting that and keeping it going on. So in uh, episode three, you're going to see more about that, about what's going on with Kevin and the relationship and and what type of direction it's going to take. Well, excellent. And one final question for you, uh, Jared, and maybe I'll ask you both this. 
at the end of the day, when it comes to vindication, Jared, when it comes to fans watching the show, obviously you want people to be entertained. But what is what is your hope for vindication when it comes to just impact in general? Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there's the, the common answer of you want lives to be permanently and eternally impacted by what you're sharing. Uh, so that, that, that's kind of the given. Anyone who's doing uh, these type of stories in the faith space, that, that, that's the end goal. And that's what you want to see. And you hope someday when you get to eternity, you get to hear about something. Maybe someone that was on the other side of the world that spoke a different language that were impacted and it triggered something or God used it to speak to their heart. Uh, what I like to say is, is vindication. Uh, you know, I like to tell good, intriguing, engaging stories in a world that God exists. Right. So much of our entertainment, I would probably say 95 percent or more. Everything happens and you either need a superhero or you need some to look deep inside yourself or whatever to find the answer. And God only exists maybe at a generic Thanksgiving Day prayer or you see a church steeple in the background. And, and the God I know, is that, that's not he doesn't sit in the background. He's actively involved in lives every day. And so I like vindication to tell good stories but where he does exist and he interacts and he speaks to people and they hear from him and, you know, they, they trust in him and see the results of that. So that's what I'm trying to do, because I think if people watch those stories and enjoy them, uh, they're going to ask for more. And, and it's going to be something they keep coming back to. And, and then hopefully it expands beyond just staring at a screen, but steps into other areas of their life. And how about you, Todd? What would you say for that question? What's your hope for the end result of the amazing work you've done playing Sergeant Travis? Well, Jared just said it very eloquently, so I don't know if I'm going to match that quite. But what I really appreciate about the show is that it shows faith in everyday life. And we don't all, you know, often see that in shows, but it also has the drum, dramatic aspect to it, you know, being a, a cop drama, cop family drama so to speak. So that's what I really appreciate. And I, I also appreciate the fact that it's the show is not afraid to get a little messy, you know, because our lives, although, you know, we live by faith, sometimes things do get messy and they're not neat, tidy endings all the time. But God is our vindication. And uh, that's what I love about the show. Well, listen, I want to thank you both so much for coming on today. And to the fans, thank you guys. And listen, tune in on September 8th. You are going to be able to watch the third episode in season two of Vindication. If you have not yet watched season one, that is streaming on Pure Flix. And season two will only be streaming on Pure Flix again September 8th. Check it out over at Pure Flix. And we will see you all again very soon. <laughs>